Uh, I think for the talk tonight, it's important that you know that I am, a, a, first and foremost, a patient. Uh, I have, um, I'm, I'm a research scientist, uh, and, but I did not do research on prostate cancer uh, until I got prostate cancer. And just for some basic stats, um, I pulled uh, my first PSA was around just, just a bit under 20. Uh, my uh, first treatment was a radical prostatectomy. My second treatment within about uh, eight months was salvage radiotherapy. My uh, treatment after that, because of rising PSA, uh, was uh, hormonal therapy, which I'm gonna talk about tonight. Uh, and I've been on various hormonal therapy regimes for over 12 years. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I have things to show for it. I, I credit this with the medication, uh, <laughs> but otherwise I think I'm doing okay. Now, it's, I really do appreciate you coming forward so I can see you. Um, uh, the, uh, if you can't hear me or I'm using technical terms, please feel free to raise your hand. Uh, I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes, and I'll have, we have time between that and the next talk to answer any questions. So I'm going to talk about helping prostate cancer patients and their partners overcome the detrimental effects of androgen deprivation therapy. And if you're not clear what that is, that's what other people, what's commonly called hormonal therapy. With increased awareness of prostate cancer and modern screening, like the PSA test, men are increasingly diagnosed and treated for the disease when they're largely asymptomatic. That wasn't the situation 20 years ago. Um, you would get prostate cancer because you had bone pain or obstruction in urination, you had problems, but nowadays you can be, have it picked up when you have no symptoms uh, and, and find you're going for treatment when you're otherwise asymptomatic. As such, any long-term suffering that patients like us might experience will more likely be from the side effects of the treatments rather than from the disease itself. That's one of the consequences of early detection. Approximately half of all men who are treated for prostate cancer will be on androgen deprivation therapy at some time during their treatment. Now, when do we use this androgen deprivation therapy? It's used in what's called neoadjuvant therapy. That's a fancy word for it, along with radiotherapy. So you know, for radiation therapy, they often put patients on, in, on hormonal therapy because it helps with the, the radiation. It can be used um, also after treatment. So you've had treatment that did, didn't hold the PSA down enough, and then they, they call it adjuvant therapy or after biochemical recurrence, and that's a fancy term for the PSA starting to climb again. Uh, or as, as a treatment, hopefully a potentially cured of one of us started early enough, or in, in, and uh, depending on the age of the patient and so forth, but if there's a metastatic disease, it can help control metastatic disease. So as I've already pointed out, approximately half of all PSA pa patients, prostate cancer patients, will be on ADT, or hormonal therapy, at some time during their treatment. What amazes me is how many men are in this treatment. I, I love this number. I ask anybody who's willing to listen to me, how many men do you think are on hormonal therapy or on androgen deprivation therapy? And very few ever guess right. But at any one time, primarily because of, uh, because of um, its use in conjunction with radiotherapy, in North America about 600,000 men are on these drugs at any one time. We don't talk about it, um, but we are that many. It's huge. Minimally 40,000 of these men, uh, men start in the long term. Well, about 40,000 men in North America die of prostate cancer, and all of them will be on hormonal therapy before they die if they were diagnosed with a disease. So that's where that number comes, comes from. There's a move towards active surveillance, that is watching and not treating uh, 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 aggressively, and intermittent therapy going on and off these drugs. Uh, and this has led to a slight decline in ADT use overall. However, because of early detection, prostate cancer patients are now starting on these drugs, on ADT, at a younger age than in previous years, and some PCA patients may now be on these, this treatment for 20 plus years, which was unheard of for a, what I call a hormonal therapy 25 years ago. <coughs> so what are my goals of the talk? So I want to talk about, the, the, uh, the, I want as goals is you to know the common psychological and social side effects of ADT. I'm not going to go into all the side effects, but we're going to talk about the psychosocial ones uh, when it's used to treat prostate cancer. Another goal is to know of the interventions that can mitigate the psychosocial impact of ADT on prostate cancer patients, including ways to help prostate cancer couples maintain intimacy and a strong bond in the face of reduced libido. So if you don't know that already, uh, these, these drugs reduce one's libido, one's sex drive. So how do you stay strong in a bind in a, in a partnership when you're on these drugs? I'll cover that mostly in the second talk, but I want to introduce it here. And lastly, the 
the goal is to understand the roles and needs of the partners of prostate cancer patients on ADT and why caring for the partners needs benefits the patients. And that's something that sometimes doesn't get a lot of attention. I think they do a better job here in Calgary than just about anywhere in Canada for being attentive to the, the needs of partners. But I'm going to talk a lot about that uh, this evening. Now, ADT, or androgen deprivation therapy, can come in various forms. One are drugs, which are chemically castrating drugs. They're not going to be permanently castrating if you don't stay on long, but if you stay on long enough, they will be permanently castrating. This is what we, and these, these drugs are fancy names, luteinizing hormone, releasing hormone. The one that is commonly used here, I think, is Eligard. Is that the one you guys know around here? Eligard, is that the one you guys know? Yeah, everybody's nodding yes, okay. So that's one of these compounds. These are chemical castrating compounds. They can also do orchiectomies. We hardly do any of them. That's a surgical castration in Canada um, for, uh, for uh, because I guess we, we don't consider it uh, uh, appropriate anymore, but in areas where people don't have a lot of money and can't afford the drugs, chemical surgical castration is still used. And what they can be used in, in combination with other drugs. Typically, we don't do that in Canada. They do it elsewhere. We don't do it in Canada because it hasn't proven to be that effective. Whether Whatever you want to call it, long-term ADT, androgen deprivation, equals castration, although it is typically euphemized to hormonal therapy in discussions with patients. So I'd be curious to know how many of you people were told that you were going on androgen deprivation therapy in those words? Not a single hand, a couple of hands. How many were told you were going on hormonal therapy and it was never called anything else but that? Mm -hmm. All right, so you can ask your doctor, why didn't, they, why didn't you tell me it was androgen deprivation therapy? Hormonal therapy equals androgen deprivation therapy equals chemical castration. Tough language. However, both MDs and patients tend to avoid the word castration because of the stigma associated with it. Although the terms above mean the same thing, patients understand them differently. And this is an interesting point. This paper is not published yet. It's out of my lab. Uh, Elena Roach was the first author, was my graduate student. In an online survey of, of men, significantly fewer when they asked by messages on a survey to, uh, for various cancer sites, if your doctor suggested uh, chemical castration for you, would you accept it? Uh, if your doctor uh, 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 recommended hormonal therapy, would you accept it? And it turns out significantly more men would accept hormonal therapy than chemical castration, even though it's exactly the same treatment. So that may justify the doctors not telling you what it is, but it will I'll come to a point later that it, we think otherwise. And we, by the way, I'd like to point to a group of people in the back that is four people sitting at the table. These are my, my collaborators here from Calgary, uh, who I do some of this research with. And uh, we think that uh, patients may, may be better off by being informed about these drugs, and that's partially what we're doing here today. Hormonal therapy in North America, Europe, Australia, uh, and Japan, the more economically uh, well-off countries, ADT is used in the form of a depot injection of these drugs. And I mentioned the major ones there, and here in this province it's largely oligarch used, but they're all the same. The drug side effects are basically, the, the drug is essentially the same drug in terms of how it works in the body. These are expensive drugs, with an increasingly long list of side effects that can affect the quality of life and the survival of prostate cancer patients, such as, hold tight guys, here's what you've got to deal with, <coughs> erectile dysfunction, in case you didn't get that from earlier treatment, <laughs> osteoporosis, a major medical concern, men who are on these drugs break bones three times more often than men who aren't on these drugs. I'm not going to talk about the treatments for that, but there are, are some. Hot flashes, just like women have, when they go through menopause, men on these drugs are going through equivalent to menopause, they get hot flashes. Loss of sexual interest, that's loss of libido. Genital shrinkage. Gynecomastia is breast development. It's a small amount, not everybody experiences, but it can happen. Impaired memory and attention. How many of you doctors said you might have some memory problems with these drugs? Did anybody, your doctors tell you that? What, at least one of you remembers your doctor telling you that. <laughs> <laughs> so is my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I'll come back to that. <coughs> Weight gain and body fat. Where I, where, when I was, the first drug I went on was, was called Lupron. It's actually the same drug as Eligard under a different name. One of the doctors who studies the side effects, uh, he, when he, he tells me, when, when he goes up to patients and says, how, they, how are you doing? The patients say, well, I'm doing fine except for this. So he actually now calls this a positive Lupron sign. When a patient grabs here, it goes like this. It's now, you can call it in this province a positive Al Eligard sign. <laughs> Loss of muscle mass. Anemia, there's actually uh, there's a, a slight uh, push towards anemia. Fatigue, a serious problem, a serious side effect, and I'll come back to that. Increased risk of diabetes, cardiovascular disease. Those are the serious medical ones. And again, we're concerned about those. And if you're on these drugs, you're going to be watching you know, for uh, 
your, your uh, uh, risk of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Increased emotionality and tearfulness. <coughs> Distress, uh, loss of identifies masculinity. Now some of these are blue and some of them are black and white. The blue ones are the ones that I'm gonna be talking about. I'm not attempting to cover the ground that an MD would cover. And by the way, I'm not an MD, if that wasn't clear. I'm a PhD research scientist. I'm not an MD. And I'll make one small aside about that. Um, uh, that it has certain legal implications. I am, I am, as an MD, I'm not, as, a, as an MD, I would be qualified to treat sick people. Uh, so I don't have a doctor of medicine, I have a doctor of philosophy. So the way I look at it is I'm only qualified to treat sick philosophies. Um, and I will be in this talk, the next one, uh, giving some philosophical discussion. Just before you jump yes. onto that, could you go back to this slide? Yeah. You may land on it again, but if I had chosen chemical castration rather than, or sorry, if I had chosen physical castration yeah. rather than chemical castration, how would that list be different? Surprisingly, there is one study only that looks at that, and what everybody assumes is that the surgical castration is going to be far more traumatic. The one study that looked at this found that um, distress, generally, uh, distress, emotional, emotional distress, anxiety distress was actually lower in the patient who had the surgical castration. And what appeared to happen is that they got a chemical castration, they'd have to go back and get new injections of this drug. They were going back to get their PSA checked and they had their time. They, they, so they were, their anxiety level went up, whereas those who the surgical castration patients had it done with and went on and lived. The side effects are otherwise identical. And that was a very subtle difference. And that was the only one. And it's a small study out of the United States. Further questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, would somebody, would a patient give up or gain something by having had physical castration versus chemical castration? No, all I said is the one small thing is they may be a little less distressed by not having to go back for the injections. I guess I, it's a leading question. It's, it's intermittent it's, uh, hormone therapy. Oh, you're asking about intermittent hormone therapy? Is well, the I mean, that's the implication. <coughs> what are you asking? I'm sorry, not clear. Well, if you have physical <coughs> you can't, You can't have intermittent hormonal therapy if you're going to go for physical castration. But in fact, in one way you can, because if you're feeling fine, you can go back on testosterone. You can get some extra testosterone. Um, so it is possible in that sense. Okay. You will be sterile. You will not be able to have more children on either, either one of them. Psychosocial side effects of ADT. So this is really what I want to concentrate on. The side effects are, have been identified in a particular paper, and, and several of my colleagues at that table and myself were co-authored on this paper. There's a review article titled Androgen Deprivation Therapy for Prostate Cancer Patients, Recommendation to Improve Patient and Partner Quality of Life. And that's what we're interested in, and I keep on pointing to the people back. Hey, John, can you actually, can I allow me to point you out? The this, this senior person at the table, the gentleman with the mustache, is John Robinson, and he's actually uh, a very good colleague in, who sort of helped bring me into this research program. Lauren Walker, who's sitting next to him, is uh, his graduate student. Susan and Amy have two undergraduates who are all working with us right now. And so it's a, so you guys are lucky. And we're very strong with the children are studying this stuff. And what happened in that review article that we all wrote is we identified five things. And I'm going to cover them in the next 20 minutes, half hour. And that are the side effects that are psychosocial, psychological and social implications to living with these drugs. Body feminization, that gynecomastia, that breast development is one. Changes in sexual performance, cognitive, that means memory, and, and effect, emotion, or mood, mood effects. Uh, cognitive and effective mood symptoms. Relationship changes, these drugs can affect the relationship, and that's what we're concerned about. Fatigue, sleep disturbance, depression. So I'm gonna talk about all of those. Let's start with the feminization. Loss of body hair. There is on these drugs, loss of body hair. Um, I'm just curious about this. How many of you patients were warned that you might lose your body hair on these drugs? Any of you? One of you. How many of you found out about it afterwards and weren't and didn't know about it? How many of you felt that they thought the doctor might have told you about it but didn't? Yes? You do, I don't care. Okay, so uh, I'll come back to that in a second. Loss of muscle mass. You lose about 4% of muscle mass on average on these drugs, but there's an increase in body weight as, as subcutaneous abdominal fat primarily, and it's about 10% gain in weight. I hit those numbers exactly, by the way. Some gynecomastia, that's breast development, and, and mastectomy, that's breast sensitivity depending on the drugs used. And that's a small one, maybe 15%. What is unstudied, which I think is fascinating, is there's probably changes in body odor, because we know that testosterone you know, produces males, well, males' odor. And that is unstudied. 
I'm hoping with colleagues in England that we can actually start that study. And I found two people there who would like to do it. Um, we're just starting to talk about doing that. Now, the reason I've mentioned it here, it sounds a little weird to talk about body odor, but if, if we are actually, and we are, a species that does still use olfactory communication, even if it's subconscious, then this could be affecting our relationships with other people. So it's worth knowing whether it's happening or not. It has uninvestigated. Uh, on the issue of alopecia, it means hair loss in the body, and gynecomastia, breast development. Those are sort of feminizing features. Patients vary greatly in how they interpret such physical side effects. Indeed, it is often assumed that hair loss, alopecia, is a trivial matter on a little consequence, but that breast growth, gynecomastia, may be devastating. And I think that's a pretty well assumed, such that the doctors don't even tell you they're going to lose body hair, but uh, patients are, but I've heard uh, telling patients that if they're going to go on these drugs, they should get their breasts irradiated so they don't grow up beforehand. And I've seen both sides of it. I've seen patients who consider the breast development absolutely trivia. I actually, I, the doctors debate whether they want to tell patients, and we're just starting to explore this, tell patients that they might lose their body hair, but I did see on an internet chat list a patient who was really ready to sue his doctor for malpractice for not having told him about that. So we really don't know what patients should be told. Uh, and it's clear that not all patients need the information or want the information. We even don't know how to, which, how to tell which patients need and want the information and which don't. All right, patients are often more bothered by the physical discomfort of nipple, nipple sensitivity, that's best, uh, best algae, than in the cosmetic issue of gynecomastia. And as I pointed out, I just said this, said it, but I'll say it again. I've no, I know of no validated questionnaires. There's no simple questionnaire to give the patient, you know, how many side effects do you wish to be told about? We don't have such an instrument. A survey instrument can be used to predict who will find such bodily changes most or least distressing. Nobody's done a study ahead of time and say, here are some of these side effects. Which ones do you think will be bothersome? And then ask them afterwards, which one did you find bothersome? We haven't done that study. Moving on to the sexual side effects. With long-term ADT use, there is testicular and penile shrinkage, impotence, that's erectile dysfunction in over 80% of men, and reduced libido, that is loss of sex drive. More than 50% of men treated for localized cancer, that is primary treatments like radiation and, and uh, prostatectomy, uh, are treated by surgery, radiotherapy, or bracket therapy, that's seeding, radioactive seeding, have residual erectile dysfunction, or ED. Only about a third find Viagra and Chialis or other phosphodiazepines. These are, those are drugs like, uh, that's a fancy name for Viagra and Chialis, find them effective. So only about a third of the patients who are, on, who are just treated primarily find these drugs effective. And for patients on hormonal therapy, they're not effective. The low libido issue was discussed more below in my second, and will be discussed more in my second talk. What about cognitive and affective symptoms? So what are those? Those are the things like changes in, in depression, or the, or the affective mood, uh, cognitive is memory. Depression, it is commonly reported, but not well documented in controlled studies. It is hard to separate it from the grief or despair of having find, found out that the primary failures have failed, and you're moving on to hormonal therapy. So that's a concern. So depression can be a concern. The literature is mixed about this, and it appears if you try to go through all the literature, uh, the depression is a bigger problem perhaps for younger patients than older ones. Similarly with cognitive effects, so this is a paper from 2006 that, that says verbal memory is significantly worse in patients on ADT, but it was a tiny study. As an aside, there's evidence that this can be reduced or reversed with transdermal estradiol. That's a female hormone that can be applied to the skin, and it appears that it can help with cognitive effects. I'll come back to that in the book again in this talk and in the next talk. However, this issue about whether the, the, what, is, what is the cognitive effect and whether estradiol can help is, a, is a, it hasn't been that replicated in a larger study. Other psychological effects have not been rigorous, rigorously studied. Depression is often associated with low testosterone. So we're, we know that men like to go on testosterone. They talk about now men on, on andropause and wanting to get testosterone to feel better. What well, also follows that if you go off of testosterone, you're going to feel not as good. There is depression is linked to this. It's not invariable. And I don't want to assume that everybody gets it. But and in fact, the literature is also mixed on that. And again, it appears to be the patient age of the patient group, um, the younger patients perhaps worse than the older patients. In cancer patients, depression may be linked as well to anxiety associated with the disease progression. So again, uh, you, you, we, got, we, we need some before and after studies, and we already a lot of them done. I don't know how many urologists, when they put patients on these drugs, actually do a depression analysis and get you know, pro, pro, professionals psychological workup on their patients before they go on these drugs. So we don't have a lot of data. On a paper, though, from 2008, de Blasio et al., these, those are the research scientists, reported a three-fold increase between rates of pre-ADT 
psychiatric illness and development of de novo, that means new illness, after starting an EDT. So if 9% of the population have these problems, 29% before, 29% are going to have the problems with these drugs afterwards. Most common, to, commonly, depression was a psychological problem reported, and that was in about 56% of the patients. So about half the patients are going to feel depressed on these drugs by themselves. Significant changes in mood, in self-rated mood, such as increased depression, tension, anxiety, fatigue, and irritability were evident during ADT treatment. That's from this paper cited at the bottom. That's a very good research group out of Seattle, um, and, and I hope to be working with her, we, but she's, we're just starting to talk about that right now, because I'm actually based in Vancouver. ADT, and I want to quote from this, may result in some adverse changes in cogn cognition and mood, However, many, but not all, that's my emphasis, of these changes can return to baseline after cessation of ADT. So i uh, ask another question. How many of your doctors who have prescribed hormonal therapy to you told you that, look, you may have some memory problems uh, if you go on these drugs. They're likely to be reversed if you go off them, but they may not be. How many of you were told that? One. Good. Two. I think, uh, well, I think we, we have a problem here informing patients about what's going on. By the way, I'm going through the side effects, but obviously, if you look at my title of my talk, I have some responsibility to talk about what to do with them, about them, and I will get to that. I'm not going to leave you in despair with this long list of side effects. I'm going to try to get to some interventions here. ADT patients, this is another quote from another one of the papers from that group from Seattle. ADT patients evidenced a significant decline in spatial reasoning, spatial ability, and working memory during treatment compared with baseline. So they're reporting different cognitive effects. That first paper said maybe verbal memory. They're saying no spatial processing. And in fact, when you look at what we know about testosterone and spatial processing, men excel at solving spatial problems. Women are much better at solving social problems. Um, and it turns out that if you take men off of testosterone, uh, get them off their androgens, they tend to have a loss in, uh, in spatial processing, which makes sense. It seems to be testosterone, male hormonal dependent. Uh, we don't know whether they can gain, or do gain, an emotional uh, 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 processing. I think they probably could if they want to put their effort into it. Both physicians and patients plus their partners should be aware of how this may manifest itself in daily life. So how does, how does this processing reflect, reflect itself? Well, if you're thinking about co solving computer games, that may be, or you know, trying to re picture how you put the carburetor back on a car, that's maybe what you're thinking about. But in fact, in daily life, when I started these drugs, I found a very realistic <coughs> example. I've got a lot of papers on my desk, the phone rings, I put another paper on, on top of the paper, and all of a sudden I just lost my work. I have no idea where it disappeared. It's in a pile of paper in my desk. That's a real life thing. Another one is that you, um, you there's been problems reported in what's called working memory. Um, and what does that mean? Well, it means you, you come to the house, you put your car keys down, uh, you head to the kitchen, where you came to the front door, you head to the kitchen, then all of a sudden you realize you put your car keys down. So you think, of, now where did I put my car keys? Uh, that would be a spatial problem. You walk into the living room, but you can't remember why you walked into the living room. That would be a working memory problem. And both of those things have manifest themselves in daily life, and I, I remember them distinctly experiencing exactly those problems. Bottom line of cognitive effects. Between 47 and 69% of men on ADT experience a decline in at least one cognitive area, one part of memory, most commonly in visual spatial ability and executive function. Working memory executive function is what I was just talking about, short-term memory. Uh, ADT is linked to subtle and significant cognitive declines in men with prostate cancer. So again, there's quote marks, quote marks around that, because I'm quoting this large review article from the major cancer journal from 2008. The authors believe, last quote on this page, the authors believe that clinicians should inform and monitor patients for the possible side effects of treatment. So this is saying, this out of this journal, cancer, big, very famous cancer journal, that the doctors should be warning, warning and monitoring patients about these cognitive effects. How about emotionality? Chains in emotionality have been repeatedly reported for androgen-deprived prostate cancer patients, as well as male-to-female transsexuals, an odd population, but they go on the same drugs when you think about it. I mean, they're getting free of their testosterone. Uh, and what the report is most, most conspicuous, conspicuously is an increase in tearfulness. And in our society, women may cry, it's saying they're sympathetic, but real men don't cry. We're not supposed to. That's our culture, right? Men don't cry, women do. But in these drugs, men feel more emotional and maybe more tearful. Increased tearfulness can thus be embarrassing to men on ADT. All right, this is going to get into the, so a little bit of the philosophical stuff. <clears throat> and in concept of what it means to be a man, because we're saying these drugs are essentially taking a hit at what it means to be a man. 
the American Cancer Society, the booklet, um, I might be on that table in the back there. The American Cancer Society wrote a booklet on uh, the title is the middle there, Sexuality and Cancer for the Man Who Has Cancer and His Partner. And it's updated and available online. I just quoted it for the 2009 edition, but it's still the same quote as there. Men who no longer have their testicles or who are on hormone therapy drugs often feel like less of a man. This is a myth. Now, just to stop there as an aside, the this is a floating pronoun, Professor. This is a floating pronoun, and it's impossible grammatically to figure out what it refers specifically back to for anybody who's a teacher here in that sentence. So it's ambiguous right there. So we don't know whether it's a myth that men believe that or it's a myth that they, that they believe they're less than a man. Anyway, man who does not, this was said emphatically, man who does not depend on hormones, but on lifetime of being male. So what are they saying here? They're saying that the, what made you a male was how you lived your life, okay? This presumption is essentially, put it in the jargon of my sociology colleagues, the male gender is socially constructed. It evolved as you lived. You lived your life, and that's what made you what you are. Uh, and, and that, once you're that, it's invariable. That is, you became a man because of how you lived your life, um, but then you're still a man, it's not gonna change. There's a problem with this. However, and now actually before I get onto this, if the problem with that is that if you had nocturnal erections, as most men do, most of your life, and you no longer have them, okay, then maybe you have lost something. Maybe things have changed. However, ADT often challenges men's core identity, leaving many feeling like they're in the border of masculinity. That is obviously sort of still a male, but something's changed. They're not fully masculine nor feminine but in an undefined, and this is a fancy word, in a liminal gendered space. Liminal means on the edge of. And actually one of the best papers on this is a small study out of Israel um, from these two authors with this bizarrely complicated title. Liminality is a biographical disruption. Unclassifiability following hormonal therapy for advanced prostate cancer. So what they did is they wrote a paper that only a sociologist or social, cultural, genetic, gender theorist might understand, but no urologist ever would. But actually, out of Canada, John Carlson at the UBC, he wrote a similar paper titled Body Masculinity and Energy Deprivation. And all of them say that these drugs take a hit in a man's sense, man's sense of masculinity. And here's a quote from one of the Nave on a Morag papers. Whenever I saw my body, I wondered, who am I? A woman, a man? It's a very confusing situation. I believe I'm neither one thing nor the other. That's the only way I can think about myself without becoming confused. To tell the truth, at first, every time I looked at myself in the mirror, I became depressed. Similar quotes for prostate cancer patients, reactions to ADT can be found in six qualitative studies published by research groups in the last eight years from Israel, Australia, England, USA, and Canada. And I was a co-author on one of the Canadian studies. So what it says here, I mean, they're saying, hey, testosterone made by your, your testicles doesn't make you a man. That's what the Cancer Society of the United States is saying. But this picture says, hey, I'm a man. I'm an ultimate man because I'm taking testosterone. And you think about it, the guys at the gyms who take uh, anabolic steroids, those are androgens, okay? They want to be hypermen. This makes them the hypermen. So if you go off of them, then you're not going to feel less of a man. I want to move on to what, what, what I think is really important. And I'm very pleased that so many of the partners are here. And many of you may not have partners. I'm sorry that they're not here, and I believe that you'll be able to access. I encourage you, if you have partners, to make to know that the video will be available to them. I'm looking to the back. Video will be available to them. I think, uh, uh, and you might want to make this available to your partner if she, if you have one, he, and the partner, your partner's not here. Okay. Faced with these such changes in their lives, many men one withdraw their affection from the physical contact of their partners. You can't perform sexually, you have a social script. We all do, if we are partnered. After enough time, we know that this signals to our partner interest in some sex or something. It may not, you know, the affection, whatever. Yeah, she may cook that meal you like, uh, you may bring home the flowers that she likes, whatever. But there are signals that we have. And what happens too often is the man knows that he can't perform sexually like he used to, so he doesn't do anything. Now, he's no longer touching her, she feels abandoned. It's a horrible problem. And these drugs have this as a problem. Faced with such changes in lives, many men, one, withdraw their affection, and two, are embarrassed by the changes they're experienced and are reluctant to discuss, this, to discuss them with their partners, which leads to, to depression and frustration in their partners. The way I phrase this, and on the next few slides, I'm gonna nail this, because I think this is such an important thing, the, the partner issue with these drugs. Basically, what I'm telling you is that we function sexually at some level, as a species. These drugs block that. So we're going to have a drug now that produces psychological effects that are communicable. 
You put the patient on these drugs, and you now communicate a psychological problem to the partner. And this paper, by the way, is by this uh, the Solways, Mark Solways, a urologist, and his wife Sydney is a so uh, social social psychologist, I guess. And uh, it's titled "Sexual, Psychological, and Dyadic." It means couples, qualities of the prostate cancer couples, and these these this information's on that, but it's been reported in several other papers as well. There's a huge cost to the partners. Studies going back to 1994 show that the psychological distress on the partners of prostate cancer patients is even greater than that on the patients themselves. So why, if you came here alone, you left your record, I said, you don't have to worry about this, I'll go to the talk and I'll tell you about it. She's probably worried. You probably, she may, well, I don't know, but it's not a good thing. All right, so the stress on her, if you're on these drugs, the stress on her is likely to be on average even greater than you. Guys can use denial, uh, women don't, they know things have changed. You may have changed, and you may be able to not notice it in yourself, or want to think about it, but she'll notice it. Uh, by the way, I want to apologize. I'm saying she, I'm talking about heterosexual couples. Uh, I don't wish to say, uh, to, 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 to ignore um, uh, same-sex couples, gay guys who might be in a partnership. Uh, it is not that, we have no evidence whether these problems are any worse or better for them, we just don't have data. So this, for the, for, based on the data we have, I'm really only talking about heterosexual couples here. For the women, it is withdrawal of intimacy in general, and not necessarily loss of coital sex. In many cases, the wives are post-menopause, they're not necessarily interested in having more kids, their sex drive may have come down themselves, but they did like to be uh, uh, cuddle, a hug, or kiss every once in a while, and if the guys have withdrawn that, they're going to feel abandoned. Okay? And this has been reported uh, in one study, and this is what they, we call a meta-study. It's been done, reported so many times. The stress of, stress of cancer diagnosis in a household is, is greater on a woman than a man, whether she is the patient or the partner. Okay? Because women uh, bear that type of stress. And what is that? The, what is the essence of the problem? It's a communication problem. Critical factors explaining a spousal's greater distress include the discordance, is a fancy term, the, the disconnect between the communication style between partners. The spouse, the partner, need, uh, women need typically to openly discuss uh, feelings, and if they're disease related, they feel like they want to talk about it. And that helps them. All right? they like the, that is, uh, they have a need to openly discuss disease related uh, feelings and problems. The husbands need, have a need, are needing to minimize the effects of the disease with little desire to openly discuss about charged issues. They know it's, they can't solve a problem. That's what it means by charged issue. And they know they're feeling differently and they don't want to talk about it. And it doesn't make it feel any better to talk about it from a guy's perspective. So now you have a problem. His, for his psychological needs, psychological needs, he would like to just not think about it. For her psychological needs, she wants to talk about it. So you can see how this problem builds and how this could be a problem for couples. Loss of intimacy harms both the patient and the partner. Women may perceive a lack of emotional mutuality and reciprocity. She's trying to reach out to him and he just not, he's not there anymore. Uh, and they may perceive it. Women as a, may perceive this as emotional abandonment in their own deficiencies and in interpersonal sensitivity. And so what happens is she says, dear, you seem upset. He says, I'm not upset. In that tone of voice. Now, what has happened? She's now upset because he's not acknowledging it. Okay? The problems have gotten worse. All right, so she blames herself. I don't know what I said to upset him, right? I see the women making some face expressions like I've talked about something, so I hit the real, I hit home, did I hit home? I'm sorry, okay, uh, all right? Which leads to a feeling that she's somehow uh, isolated and socially inadequate, and thus she ends up with poor mental health. Now, if I have one sentence in the whole 45 minutes or so that I'm talking to you, it's here, I'll repeat in the next slide. Distress in the partners correlates with the distress in patients. Namely, there is evidence of a par of partner effects, at least for women. That is, here's a sentence, women's distress predicts men's physical health over and above the men's distress age and cancer stage. I think this should be brand on the walls of every urological clinic in the world. What we're saying is, uh, you've shut, you the guys, uh, we males have shut down our wives because we can't deal with this problem. She wants to talk about it. She's now very distressed. The catch is, she reads us, women, our wives, and get them talking about heterosexual couples, read us better than we read ourselves, right? She knows we change, even though we can, you know, we don't see ourselves change, we walk by the mirror, we're, we can either deny it or not think about it and be happy with that, all right? So she's very distressed. It turns out her distress level will predict our physical health. So if she's distressed, we're gonna pay the price. 
this is like a horrible, terrible situation, and we should be really attentive to it. That's what I've just said is so important that I'll say it again. There is a Parkinson's effect in that the distress in the partners of a prostate cancer patient correlates to the distress in the patient. For heterosexual couples, it was in the last slide, women's distress predicts men's physical health over and above the men's, men's distress, age or cancer stage. That is, if she's, if she's uh, unhappy, you are in trouble. In common language, if patients are not talking with their partners about how ADT makes them feel, they are hurting their partners and will pay a price in the long run. Please, guys, take that home with you. Okay, that message. Moving on, my fifth one was fatigue, sleep disturbance, and depression. Depression has already been discussed. Sleep disturbances can be associated with, with insomnia. That's our essentially, our, you see that as insomnia, not able to sleep. Leading to daytime fatigue. If you're getting bad sleep at night, you're gonna, you will be, may be fatigued during the day. And if you have some anemia from these drugs, they'll also make you feel fatigued. Insomnia itself can result from nocturnal hot flashes. So these drugs cause hot flashes. If they occur in the middle, they occur in the middle of night, you can lose sleep. Um, the trio of symptoms of depression, insomnia, and fatigue are common in many cancer patients. Insomnia patients itself can also, here's another example of communicable disease, right? You're not sleeping because you got hot flashes. You're rolling over in bed. You're waking up your partner. Now she's sleep deprived. So again, we have this communicable nature of the distress produced by androgen deprivation therapy. When ADT is administered for disease progression after failed primary treatments and a cure of treatment is no longer an option, psychological distress manifested by this trio is not surprising. So they often talk, the psychologist, about this trio, and this is not uncommon for these drugs. So I had certain goals for this talk. One is I felt we needed to know what are the common psychological and social side effects of ADT when used to treat prostate cancer, and that's in blue. I also want to understand the roles and needs of the partners of prostate cancer patients on ADT. But I made another pledge to you a few minutes ago, that was in the middle here, to know the various interventions that can mit mitigate the psychological impact of ADT on prostate cancer patients, including ways to help prostate cancer couples, I'm talking too fast, ways to help prostate cancer couples maintain intimacy in a strong diet, a strong couple, in the face of reduced libido. So I, I have a pledge to you to try to talk about what to do about that. I've been on a fairly extensive suite of side effects in these treatments. And now we, I mean, I, how much, what time is it? How are we doing time-wise? I have another 15 minutes or so. Okay. What can be done? Well, a lot of that will be in the second talk. Well, at least in terms of the sexuality and intimacy, to explore our options. <clears throat> in the second talk, I'm going to go explore options that go way beyond standard treatments for erectile dysfunction, ED, which are too often ineffective. There's ED treatments not going to help these populations pretty much, uh, unless they're extreme, like penile implants. So, while we're going to talk in the next talk uh, about options, uh, particularly for patients on ADT. Um, and uh, since the effects, the side effects impact both the patient and the partners, addressing these side effects is an issue for couples and not just individual patients. Since the physical and psychological side effects interact, they need to be addressed concurrently. So if you've heard about, you've had advice about what to do for being on ADT, uh, you should think about it as a couple. What should you as a couple do? If exercise is good for his <coughs> mood, then encourage him to exercise or go, go exercise with him. Because if his mood is better, your mood will be better, and he'll live longer for it, even if he doesn't uh, get benefit from the exercise itself. <coughs> okay, what can we do? SSRIs and SNRIs are versions of various antidepressants. That's a class of medication, but they have lots of effects that can be used for pain management and so forth. They help relieve hot flashes, which can improve sleep, <coughs> which can therefore reduce daytime fatigue and improve cognitive function. So even though you might, the doc, you may feel moody or sleep deprived or fatigued, uh, but you feel, I, I don't want to be on an antidepressant, that's a psychotropic drug. Well, you're on ADT, which is a very psychotropic drug affecting your brain, and if something will help uh, with, with the mood and with the hot flashes, go for it. So these are drugs that work, there's several different classes, and, and, uh, and if you're feeling those fatigue, uh, hot flashes, depression, uh, Etc. Then, then it's worth trying these drugs. The single best documented intervention for most ADT non-sexual side effects is exercise. If I could change the milieu of all support groups in North America, prostate cancer support groups, I would turn them into exercise and support group uh, organizations. 
The best thing we could all be doing is exercising. And it's a bit difficult to do on these drugs, and it would be helpful if we had uh, social pressure and community that you guys could talk about amongst yourself, but it's a, I think it would be a great thing for uh, a single to support group in Canada to start an exercise group. Because um, we know that works. That has been the most help, single help, document helpful thing for patients on ADT. Transdermal estradiol. So I mentioned this hormone. Estradiol is a female hormone. It turns out that us men have this female hormone in our body. In fact, we make it from testosterone. Okay? And there's all sorts of places in our brain which latches on to estradiol. This is the main female hormone. So when you put a guy on androgen deprivation therapy, you've now taken him off of not just testosterone, but estrogen. And I'm very much interested in add back estrogen. Uh, we know that it can, taken this, you can take it through the skin, which is better. It turns out they used to be estrogen, they took orally, but they caused blood clots. But take it through the skin that doesn't seem to have that risk. Transdermal estradiol can help with mental acuity. That's, that was the early study I mentioned, beer study about cognitive function, suggesting estradiol, estradiol could help. We know it can help with hot flashes. It will help reduce osteoporosis, that bone loss problem. And I'll mention in passing that it actually can help preserve libido, at least in some animal studies. But it, can, it, will, it will increase breast development a little bit more gynecomastia. A, a note on the hot flashes. Many drugs can help, but I personally favor estradiol because it's natural. We normally have it in our body, so I, I talk about add back estradiol. Estradiol is the natural compound that keeps men from having hot flashes. So why should you have hot flashes if you're going to be in these drugs? Just take a little estradiol and you wouldn't, you, you're going to lose anyway, but you didn't need to lose and get add back estradiol, and I strongly recommend that. Nocturnal hot flashes that disturb, disturb sleep can cause daytime fatigue and cognitive impairment. We've already mentioned that. However, nocturnal hot flashes may not be remembered. This hasn't been well studied. It hasn't been studied in men at all. It's just a suggestion from one unpublished study from women. But imagine that you're getting hot flashes in the night. They're disturbing your sleep, but you're not remembering them the next morning. But during the day, you're fatigued, you're depressed, okay, and you have memory problems. It could be that you had a lousy night of sleep. Right? So my feeling is that any patient who's going on ADT should also get some add back estrogen. Should probably start on estradiol. Now I may cause grief in this town, and you can remember, if you take that to your doctor, please note that I am not an MD. This is a single patient's personal advice, and it's not medical advice. Okay, I'm not qualified. Qualified to give medical advice. However, therefore, even if a patient on AD thinks that he is not having hot flashes, but nevertheless is feeling tired, and that his memory isn't as good as it used to be, he might try some transdermal estradiol. A more, more bit, of, a bit more on estradiol. In studies with castrated male rats, because you start these studies, you do the research of rats to start conveniently, estradiol helps protect libido. I'll tell you where those data come from in a minute. It also improves sleep quality and reduces daytime fatigue. However, it is contraindicated in, in cancer independent. That is, your cancer is growing fast. The estradiol could be dangerous. It's just like with uh, other cancers, like for women, we know that if they have ovarian cancer, you get them off of estrogen. If you give them estrogen, it could be dangerous. So uh, there's a strong, and if there's a strong family history of breast cancer, just like women who have breast cancer with family history, they go on, on estrogen blocking drugs. If you have a long, strong family history as a guy uh, with it, for breast cancer, you probably don't want to be on estradiol. Now, in fact, uh, the paper that shows that it can protect libido, we did a review article. This is my graduate student. This is maybe just early this year in the Journal of Neurology published a paper, <coughs> Role of Estrogen in Normal Male Function, which was a review article suggesting that estradiol could actually help libido. And in my lab, my student Eric, just last month, got data confirming this for rats. We could actually preserve their libido by giving them add back estrogen after we castrate them. Furthermore, last month, which actually has got a 2012 date, but it came out in the last month. Estradiol treatment modulates some spontaneous sleep and sleep recovery after sleep deprivation and castrated rats. What that says is we, if we disturb their sleep and we give them some estrogen, they will actually recover from their sleep okay, and have less daytime fatigue with estradiol. For me, that is ready to go to clinical trials. Last week, I talked with the top head of urology out in Vancouver, and our goal is to start a clinical trial with actual patients where we put them on ADT on LHRH, acting the starts like Elgar, and give them a little bit of transdermal estradiol right from the start and see if it can help relieve the symptoms of these drugs. So I'm actually involved right in these estradiol studies. But I'm also biased. I'm here as a patient, so I've got to tell you, I'm on estradiol. I looked at the data, I looked at the literature, and I said, the heck, I don't want to be on those LHRH agonist drugs. So for the last 12 years, I've been on estradiol. Now, you can judge the following. I'll let you do this. I'm making this up as I go. <laughs> I have the side effects of those, the drugs. I don't think I'm too cognitively impaired. Uh, 
I don't, do, you, do I press you as being cognitively impaired? Perhaps. I hope. But I also have got to commit. This stuff is real. Okay, so I had to make a just a strategic decision. Okay, I could not be on estradiol, which meant that I wouldn't have any breasts. But my, I was on Lupron for a while, on Elgar for a while, and I couldn't think. And I thought about it. I said, if I have a choice between having no brains and no breasts, or having brains and breasts, I decide to go with brains and breasts. So I just went off of the Elgar and went on to estradiol. So I just take estradiol. I take it high dose, and it's good enough to keep my testosterone down. A note on exercise. Nine studies have been published on exercise and intervention for managing ADT side effects. Collectively, they show, this is what you get from exercising, more muscle strength and endurance, a positive benefit. Cardiovascular risks, the studies are mixed on the effects. Um, weight control, no benefit, but I just saw a person told me they have a papers coming out showing that they did get some weight control on the, for the exercise for patients on ADT. They had like seven patients on it. And fatigue and depression, positive benefit. Patients on ADT should exercise even if it doesn't help them control their weight. Patients, um, you should know and understand the benefits of exercise and force yourself to do it. <coughs> I don't like to exercise. I don't, I, don't, I don't like going to the gym alone. My wife doesn't wish to go to the gym with me. I go alone. But you guys can, can get together. If you want to do something to help yourself in this room or an ADT, okay, within the lim limits of what you can do, so talk to the guy next to you and say, Let's, we're going to work it out. We'll get to the gym if you're not, if you're not doing that already. <coughs> Okay, so to get to the bottom line, to summarize my punchline for the talk, so what helps patients most dealing with the psychological and social side effects of these drugs? One, I think, knowing the side effects. That's a bias. We're studying, this, we're studying that right now. John, myself, and the students back there. Is to our patients better off to know about the side effects or not? That is a, an actual research question. Possibly some add back estradiol, because you don't need to take the guys off estrogen when you put them on ADT, but we do. So I'd say possibly some estrogen, uh, add back estradiol, but it's not oral. Either take it, take it to the skin as a gel or a patch. <coughs> possibly some antidepressant medication. Communicating. Open, honest, full discussion. If you go home and you, and you cry, look, it really is that bad, and you talk about it, you may feel awkward having to do that and talk to the guys. But God, you'll be relieving your partner for your being open and honest about it, because she sees it, even if you don't. All right? Communicating, open, honest, full discussion with your partner about how ADT makes you feel to help reduce her distress. This is my point four, because in the long run, if her distress is down, your survival and health will be better for it. Alone. And lastly, with the exclamation point, exercise. All right? Now, we need to know more about this. So, one, two, three, Four of the five authors on this paper, which just got accepted in press, are in the room right here, and Lauren's at the back there. And this paper is titled, Seven Patients and Partners Lack Knowledge of ADT and De uh, Deprivation. So through this talk, I've said, how many of you were told this by your doctors? And a few hands over here went up, okay? We feel, um, and we've shown, I shouldn't say we, we've shown that patients' knowledge about these drugs is, is very low. We don't know whether that is because um, the patients are so shocked when the doctors tell them they're going to go on it that they're not remembering what they heard. While well, the pharmacist gave them the, the uh, sheet describing the, uh, the side effects, we found that those sheets don't describe most of the side, side effects, by the way. Um, so this paper shows that patients and the partners are not well informed at all about ADT side effects and what to do about them. Of course, and we don't know that, that the following is the problem that the healthcare providers aren't telling the patients or that the patients and the partners are not assimilating the information. So we now have gone back, uh, John's uh, uh, overseeing this project, and, and uh, Susan Tran there, raise your hands, let's wait for the crowd, is uh, actually doing this for our honors project here at the University of Calgary. And she's going out and asking this, the doctors, what are you telling the patients about ADT? This is a project that's running now in Alberta, uh, Ontario. Questionnaires are going out uh, in uh, Nova Scotia, and they'll also be going out in, in uh, British Columbia. It's now under investigation. What about sex itself after ADT? Yes, it is possible. But again, it is not clear that the healthcare system is fully informing prostate cancer patients about all the options in this regard. So, I invite you all to stay for my next talk. We're going to talk about rediscovering sex after prostate treatments. That is the next talk coming up. Um, and I will be discussing uh, that aspect, the specifically the sexual aspects of the next talk. Thank you very much, and I'm open to any questions you might have. One back there, yes. Um, Dr. Wasser said there are a number of oncologists in North America, most of them in the United States, that are at the cutting edge. 
who work very, very hard at taking patients that have uh, prostate cancer uh, through ADT therapy to a level where the, uh, the PSA is close to undetectable, let's say less than 0 0.01. And having achieved that level for a period of, depending on which oncologist you're talking about, one year, two years, three years, will stop the ADT and, that will, and will instead introduce an intermittent therapy regime to allow uh, the physical, the psychophysical, the emotional uh, qualities that were lost to regain. Right. Any comments about that? Yeah, I actually, I, I object to something you said. You made it sound like this was a, a, a U.S. idea. No, uh, no Because actually it's a, it is a, my new colleague out at UBC, Larry Goldenberg, who's probably been the major promoter of intermittent hormonal therapy. Uh, so it's, a, it's actually, a, we get as much credit as Americans do. And I think it's a very reasonable program. I didn't mention it at all. I'm talking about when you're on the pain, what are you going to do when you're on the drugs? And of course, one of the things to do is to get off the drugs. So intermittent hormonal therapy, if your PSA is low enough, and if it is controlled reasonably well, is, is, has been very recently shown to be just as good as staying on it long term. The question I get then is, well, when I come off of estradiol, and I, my answer is no, I'm doing so well, why bother? I, 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 so, uh, so, that's, so I'm in a different game than that. But in terms of the LHR agonists, if you can't convince your doctor to, uh, to not try them, then you can keep your PSA down with it for a couple of years, and then there's no harm in coming off, at least according to the most recent data. And that's really recent data showing that. Um, so I, I support it at this time. And the other comment is that um, those doctors that promote that, and this is both Canadian and American doctors, um, say that as long as you're not on ADT for too long, and I think three years is kind of the absolute maximum, I have a point where <coughs> three years right now, they say that you will recover many of the physical functions that you've lost. Yes, you will, but one year continuous ADT will uh, brought, will depress the Sertoli cells which produce sperm. So your sperm count will not recover if you're on it for more than a year, quite to what it was. It will recover, but not completely. Uh, and, but the, the simplest way of looking at it is the longer you are on them, the slower, the longer it will take to recover. That's one thing. Uh, the other part about it is that what we don't have any in this, uh, this new promotion of intermittent hormonal therapy is we don't really know what are the best cutoff points. So the doctors haven't reached an agreement to say, well, when, when you're, some of them will say when your PSA reaches 20, uh, that's when you should do it. And others will say when your PSA reaches 2, uh, you know, and it was undetectable, we'll put, you, we'll put you back on it. We really don't know. Uh, that we, and it'll take, unfortunately, for that type of study, it's going to take decades to collect enough data to know exactly when to go on and when to go off. Okay? Other questions? Uh, if not, we can take a break. And uh, how much time do we have before the second I'm talk? I'm curious uh, about no. your sense of the difference between the Canadian system of delivery of services, uh, oncology services, versus, for example, the U.S. system, in the sense <coughs> of your study where you uh, implied that there's inadequate information being provided by oncologists relative to ADT. My impression is that we have a relatively concentrated delivery system here, certainly in, in Calgary, of the professionals. Concentration of information about the drugs? No, concentration of the individual uh, oncologists. We, we cluster them and, and uh, the Allegard is really only available through the, the socialized practices that we have here. So why should there be such a information gap? I can understand it in the U.S. system where there's a much more uh, dispersed keep delivery of services. Keep in mind, we, we really don't know why there's an information gap. It could be simply that the patients are so shell-shocked when they're told about it, they're not remembering it. It could be the doctors aren't telling them. Uh, it could be that the side effects of the drugs, once they're on it, they were told it and they remembered until they went on the drugs. <laughs> the drugs. There, do you I mean, so sense we know. that there might be a difference yeah. in the so delivery I cannot, between these two systems? I cannot speak to that because I have not been a patient mm -hmm. in, the, in the other system than in Canada. Um, the closest I've come is those, those papers where we're actually looking at what estradiol does. Um, the first paper is co-authored with a guy named Paul Shellhammer. Paul Shellhammer 
I mean, I, I work at an odd level. I'm a patient, right? Yeah. Uh, but I figured I got to find somebody who's interested in this stuff. Paul Schellheimer was the past president of the American Neurological Association. He's published probably a hundred papers on prostate cancer because he's a research scientist and an MD and a urologist, uh, and he's a prostate cancer patient himself. And he uses estradiol, so we teamed up on this. So I can speak from an N of one in the United States, and there's one urologist, one urologist who happens to think that that this stuff should be getting out. To, to the other doctors and he's going to co with them. But other than that, I really don't know to what extent. Uh, and in fact, I don't even know what's right. There are certain patients who don't want to know and don't need to know, and there are some patients who really do need to know, and we probably are not giving them nearly enough information. And the same thing can be said about their partners. There are partners who, who are happy to be left out of it, and there's partners who want to make sure that they know more about these drugs than their doctors ever knew. And some, we, we got to figure out a way we ultimately need a way of trying to offer a questionnaire as you go in to see your doctor, which helps somehow helps us decide who needs the, our huge information dump and who doesn't. And I don't mean just simply who wants it and who doesn't, but I mean who will profit from it and who will be more distressed out from it. We want to know what would be helpful in terms of presenting information and what is the most helpful amount of information to present to individuals. And we are just at the edge of being able to start to study that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, John, did I say that right? Sorry. A couple of further comments. I mean, one of our concerns is that if, if people don't know about some of these side effects, then it leaves them in, in a position of not being able to do anything in a preventative way. For example, if you don't know that you're likely to gain weight, then that leaves you in a position of not taking any action to try to reduce the amount of weight that you would put on. Or if you don't know that you're going to lose muscle mass, then, you know, you're, you're probably not going to be in a position to say, okay, I need to go out and, and exercise. So the position that we take is that at least for some of these side effects where there are things that people can do, that they should be informed so that then they can know, okay, there are certain things that they can do to perhaps uh, reduce the significance of those side effects, whether it's exercise to help them keep strong, control their weight, understand about what the sexual side effects are and the effects on the relationship so that they can do something uh, to try to prevent those problems from developing, uh, becoming more exacerbated and tractable. Does that help the moment? Yes. Except okay. Okay. May I share please? Um, I, I hear you saying things like did the patient not hear what the oncologist said and, and I, that's where I would say um, that's where the female, the, the partner, really needs to go to every appointment and listen and take notes and do the research too. Okay, so one of the cute, I think, discoveries in our paper where we asked patients and partners, uh, what do you know about these drugs? Mm -hmm. We found, and we're assuming that as patients and partners they had equal exposure to the various sources of information, or potential of equal exposure. And one of the rather fascinating things that fell out of it is that the guys were significantly statistically more aware that they were going to get uh, penile shrinkage, genital shrinkage, and significantly less likely, whereas the women were more aware that there'd be emotional changes and depression. So uh, if they're going to the same talk, they're still evidently assimilating and attentive to different things. So they both need to be there because they both are going to be affected by these drugs. And when you get home, then you can share. Yeah. Uh, did you hear? Uh, and, and I, well, yeah, um, I'm in complete agreement with you, but I'm just saying that even when they're in the same room together, they may actually right. come home and say they heard different things. They can't come with different um, to speak more about uh, the uh, stopping of the ADT, um, um, first, I guess I must explain. I am a widow of a ADT cancer patient. <coughs> who went to exercise and went to psychosocial and uh, um, uh, who went to all the appointments as well. And when they suggested the stopping of the ADT, my husband was delighted. And uh, the unfortunate thing is that uh, once the cancer reoccurred, it galloped. It, it was a case of uh, there being no uh, help even with the uh, repeated or the readmission uh, or readministration of the ADT. So I think we all still are in a very big puzzle and I'm so glad that you're continuing to speak about this.
Thank you. Richard, uh, another thing that I think is helpful for people to remember, it was I think on your first slide, is how the face of prostate cancer has, has changed. That historically, uh, androgen deprivation therapy was used when men's disease was very advanced, uh, when the man was, was very old. And in many cases, the man only lived for a couple of years while on this treatment. Now, with prostate cancer being diagnosed, men in their, in their 40s and in their 50s being on these drugs for in excess of 10 years, it's only now that we're beginning to understand many of these side effects that Richard pointed out. Um, when we did that exercise study that your husband was involved with, we started to do bone mineral densities routinely. And everybody was so surprised to find out how commonly men have um, osteoporosis. And it changed the practice within the Tom Baker Cancer Center, where now men's bone mineral density is being routinely monitored. That's only changed within, what, the last, how many years ago was your husband in that study? Um, it began eight years ago. Yeah, so that's within the last 10, 10 years. So. Our understanding about the effects of androgen deprivation therapy, you know, as you saw, many of the papers that Richard quoted were just within the last, you know, five or six years. So this is a field that's that's very rapidly changing, and physicians are scrambling to, you know, to try to understand what are the effects of these drugs on men, on their relationships, what can be done to, to help people live as well as they possibly can. So my suggestion now is to your young students or, or, or practitioners is to develop a questionnaire that follows uh, the, the <coughs> medical visit. What do you understand from today's discussion? Yeah. And that would be your follow-up at home and also, um, you know, continuing to go to um, peer support groups. They can be, they can be helpful. Uh, I think what you guys have in uh, the Calgary here sounds like to me one of the best support groups I've seen uh, in terms of size and, and uh, I'm really, really impressed with what you offer here. I'd like to do one thing though. Uh, being sensitive, I think I try to be sensitive to the partners. I want to also point out that as a prostate cancer patient, the sensitive thing to do is have uh, regular uh, breaks to hit the men's room because uh, some of these drugs and treatments have urinary side effects. So I'd like to suggest that we break up formally and, we, and I'd be available here uh, to uh, answer any questions on a more individual basis until the next talk. Uh, I want to thank you again for coming to the talk.